He says, would you like to go ass sliding with me right now? That, that's not <laughs> our description. The town calls it ass sliding. Ass sliding. She would have slapped him. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Alice. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked ass. Welcome back to Chat Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like we used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm one of your hosts, Gene Lyons. Alongside me is my co-host, Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. Ash has the night off. Each week, we take a look back in time to set for our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get our respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button to share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we view TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all the information and past episodes at chatpod.com slash TV. And finally, to hang out with us live, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, chatpod.com slash Twitch, where we play video games host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, Big D, what movie are you reviewing today? Gene and listeners out there, I, I can't lie. This is, I'm so excited for today. This is a long time coming, and it's partially because of the movie. It, it makes me smile. It makes me happy. But it's also what our commissioner did. So our commissioner for this movie is Frank Fall. And, and we have a lead time of about a year now in the commissions that are great listeners out there, you folks, like, commission you're willing to wait patiently frank decided to become his own hype man and he started about six months out leaving us these these voicemails that were mixed between like wwf and like maybe like the hell track promotions but like yeah six months to red i can't wait so i found myself being like wow we're getting there we're getting there and tonight is that day gene it is that we're gonna head on the track we're gonna put on our our gear our hockey helmet And we're going to go out there and just race for our town, for ourselves, for our family. Fuck the SATs. We're going to do it. And we're going to review the 1986 sports film, Rad. So anytime I'm traveling, I like to queue up as many Shat movies as possible so I can watch them while I'm on the plane or at the airport during layovers. And so this time I was coming back from Costa Rica and I'm going through the movies that I need to watch for Shat and Rad comes up. And I'm so excited. I start talking to everybody around me like, hey, do you want to sit next to me on the Southwest flight? We're going to watch Rad. And every time I'd say Rad, I'd go, Rad, Rad. Nobody wanted to watch this movie with me, (laughs) but I was pumped for it. And that's all that matters. So let's hear it in his own words in a voicemail from Frank. Two weeks till rad. My bike is at Autobell getting detailed, ready to pick up Lori Laughlin in that bike suit. Yeah. Your flames never die. Two weeks to rad. Healing. <laughs> Don't ever stop believing. I believe I made it to this moment where Brad's finally going to get the shot pod. Yeah. Cause there's thunder in your heart. <laughs> Every move is like a lightning. lightning. All right, let's get to serious business here. I could talk about this movie forever, but this one goes <laughs> out to all those small town kids who it was all about bikes, playing baseball, riding around your neighborhood with your friends. This movie means a lot, but let's get right down to it. This movie is not the greatest cinema spectacle of all time but it's got laurie laughlin in a bike suit it's got some slow dancing on bicycles it's got hell track and it's got thunder in your heart and with those four things all i ask this is all i ask is this better than mac and me and mac and me is 4.17 in my heart this movie is a zero to one but realistically Let's just put it somewhere in the 3.5, 3.75 range, and I'll be happy. So enjoy the movie. This one goes out to all those people that all they wanted to do was ride their bikes around town with their friends. Just enjoy it for what it is. Just 
get on your bike and thunder in your heart around your neighborhood <laughs> one time. Just dust it out. <laughs> pump up the tires, man. If you can barely ride a bike, you listen to thunder in your heart. <laughs> It'll make you ride at least 40, 50 miles an hour around your neighborhood, <laughs> ride around your cul-de-sac. Don't put on a helmet. That's for kids these days. Get out there and just ride the wind, man. Get the BMX out. Put Lori Laughlin on the back. Hey, and one more thing. I think in June, I got Tango and Cash coming up. I'm thinking about Terry Hatcher. Oh, yeah. Dancing on that stage. Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate you doing this movie. Man, make it better than Mac and me. All right. I got another movie coming later. I saw it's not on the list. I appreciate y'all. Lori Laughlin in that bike suit. See if it's still playing in the background. No, it's over on my iPad. All right, man. Appreciate y'all. Love you. Bye. I think we pride ourselves, Gene, on being honest, right? We we try to always say how we feel. Frank makes it almost impossible. You have to root for him. I've never felt a bigger divide between my subjective enjoyment of a movie and my objective need to warn people it's not for everybody. Because I think people would think we were crazy if we gave it like a low wipe score because of the fact that the movie has obvious flaws. Yet at the same time, in my heart, in the thunder of my heart, I... I I get a smile on my face every time I think about this movie, and I can't distinguish whether it's my love for Frank or my love for Rad. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I want to go take my bike out. I want to pump up tires, hit the cul-de-sac. I think that's a universal truth. And Frank, you said, you know, this is like the for the guys out in rural America, the guys who are in the small towns. I think bikes, and we'll get into it, it's a universal truth for kids that grew up at least in the 80s and the 90s that your bike was, was, was the, the time that you changed your life. You became free. And uh, hopefully we do this movie justice for you. Rat is a 1986 sports movie directed by Hal Needham from a screenplay by Sam Bernard and Jeffrey Edwards, who is the son of Pink Panther creator Blake Edwards. The film stars Bill Allen, Lori Laughlin, Talia Shire, Jack Weston, and Ray Walston, along with 1984 Olympic gymnastics champion Bart Connor. The film received mixed reviews and was a box office bomb, grossing $2 million against a budget of $3 million. Big D, we always ask where you were and what your memories are of the movie. What do you remember about Rad? So as much as BMX biking and just biking in general as a kid was a big part of my life, I surprisingly had never seen this before. And I think it's because of the limited release and that it kind of bombed. So there was no word of mouth. You know, once it came out on video, though, it was top 10 for like two straight years. So it did find its audience there. But I, I kind of hinted a little earlier here when talking about Frank that I think BMX biking, it is a huge, huge deal to anyone who grew up in the 80s and the 90s. For me and my friends were no different. And I think a bike, it's a symbol. When you are, are forced to walk everywhere, there's a limited range. Your territory as a kid is kind of small. You got to be able to get home in time. You know, it's hard to get places. But once you get that bike, you expand to where you can go. Adventure comes with it. And if you combine that with the 80s parents like mine, who really didn't check up on you, as long as you were home for dinner and the police didn't show up, they almost did not care what you did. So that freedom to just go out in the morning, you pump up your tires, you pedal down your friend's house, and you didn't know where the day was going to take you. You feel the wind in your hair. It was liberating. And until when I was probably 18 and I got a 1982 Volkswagen Rabbit for 800 bucks, my first bike, a Huffy, was the biggest single purchase that ever changed my life. Oh, man, it totally changed the amount of ground you could cover. Like your life was your block until you got that bike and suddenly your life was a couple miles and that became super exciting. We had canal paths where I grew up and so that was just no cars in the way. Just like you said, wind in your hair, four or five dudes cruising around, nothing to do all day. Fantastic. Dude, you could also throw some like uh, the pegs on the back and then you became a two person vehicle. I was the uh, the megaphone, like the bullhorn uh, and turn signals guy. It's like $20 upgrade to your bike, and suddenly you were basically in my head a motorcycle. That was the move. Fuck a passenger. I want that bling. Mm. Before watching it for Shaft the Movies, I'd never seen Rad, but I remember the cover art from the video store. It looked fucking cool. It doesn't look so cool now, but at the time, it looked action-packed. It looked exciting. It had like a just a hint of California citrus in it. But after hearing Frank's reminder voicemail from six months out, I felt like I was an old fan of this movie. I felt like I had seen it before. 
and it made me partial to the movies in a way that I was already defending it as I was watching it. Like there was an imaginary person criticizing. It. I was like, no, 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 you don't get it, man. This movie's for real. <laughs> it's extreme. Without further ado, let's hit the trailer. They say this guy Bart Taylor's gonna walk hell track. I don't know. It's gonna take a radical miracle to beat this guy. <laughs> And we're here for the biggest and most important bicycle motocross event ever held, Hell Track. You're gonna do it? You're gonna try to qualify? I don't want to hear any more about it. Okay, dudes, let's walk this sucker. Teenage BMX racer who lives in a small town with his younger sister, Wesley, and their mother. When Hell Track, the Super Bowl of BMX racing, comes to a small town, Crew is faced with a tough decision. Qualify for Hell Track or take the SAT in order to attend college. Winning Hell Track means $100,000, a new Corvette, and fame. Crew decides to set aside the SAT and race against his mother's wishes. So this movie starts out with perhaps the biggest miscalculation on the part of the filmmakers because the premise is exciting. BMX racing, you don't need more than that. Instead, the opening montage focuses heavily on bike stunts. And that's no surprise because the movie was directed by a stuntman, Hal Needham. But the entire opening segment of the movie is just dudes doing fucking tricks on bikes to incredibly confusing song lyrics. And I wasn't pumped or interested. I was more pumped before I hit play than I was about three minutes in. The most exciting part of that opening montage was actually seeing the 7-Eleven hot dogs priced at three for a dollar, which just made me hungry. Yeah, but the movie's supposed to be about racing. It's about hell track. It's about going out there and becoming a BMXer. They focus on the freestyling. To me, I never liked it because with a bike, you have limited tricks you can do unless you get into like the the vert ramp and start doing like you're actually using like part of the terrain. It's kind of boring to me. I wanted to go out there and I wanted to see them doing some more extreme stuff. And if you compare this, okay, if this was gnarly and extreme back in the 80s, all you have to do is go on to YouTube, go on to TikTok and you see some of these crazy videos now, Gene where people on mountain bikes are like driving at high speed through trees or on the ridge lines of like sheer cliffs, people falling, people flipping. And today you just got to watch the X game stunts and they will blow away anything this movie does. They do truck driver 360 bar spin or tail whips or some 720s. The guys today are doing shit that is truly crazy. If you had shown the stunts today to these kids in the 80s, their heads would have exploded. Yeah, for people who haven't seen this movie or haven't seen it in a while, the kind of stunts we're seeing at the beginning of Rad is like guy hopping on front wheel or guy standing on pegs, hopping on back wheel or guy push, doing a wheelie pushing while the wheel spinning. backwards. Yeah. yeah, push the wheel back. And at one point, there's like this pipe that they ride into. It's like, oh, fuck, this motherfucker is going to go a full 360 in the pipe, maybe multiple times. That loop I got excited about. No, he goes up about six feet, turns around, comes back down like it's a half pipe. Come on, Rad. Yeah, or they're doing like a wheelie and they start spinning like the the front handlebars because they had that cool contraption where the the cables for the handlebars were separated by a bearing. And it was like, whoa, rad. It was extreme. But I have to share my personal experience here. Fuck the movie. I got to tell you my bike journey. I remember my first Huffy. I bought it at the local toy store. It was called like the Toy Box. It was 50 bucks. So 50 bucks back in like 83 was a lot. This was a collection of uh, paper route money and cutting the grass. I had that for a few years, but it was one of those bikes like Walmart bikes today where if you leave it out, it rusts. So that thing started to fall apart. And there was a legendary bike in my neighborhood. There was a kid who had money who had grown up and he was now like teenage years to where he didn't bike anymore. And it was a chrome thruster. And for anyone out there remembers, it had the three bars on the frame. The whole frame was chromed out. And it sat and rusted in this kid's backyard. And it was like legend. Everybody would talk about it. It was like Christine. So one day I got up the courage. I went and knocked on this kid's door. And I said, hey, will you please sell it to me? He's like, "Ah, I don't know yet. You know, the bike was whatever, probably 600 bucks. And I think he felt sorry for me. So he eventually sold this thing to me for a couple hundred bucks. And it had like the best parts. It had red line cranks. It had bear trap pedals. It had a GT head. It was rough, so I actually spent probably six months, took it apart, cleaned it. I This was my Christine. I brought her back to life. About a week later, I drove down to the local video connection store just to run in and drop off the tape. Somebody fucking stole the bike from right out in front of the store, 
never saw it again. And the other, like the group of bike kids in town were like, oh yeah, I saw somebody driving it. You know, if I get it for you, will you give me the cranks? Will you do this? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Trying to negotiate to get my own bike back when I know these kids stole it. But sadly, until, you know, my parents bought me a Skyway, a white tricked out one the next year. It was never the same. That first Christine, when I lost her, I lost a piece of my heart. I think I'm on the record as being anti-maintenance. Like that amount of work that you did just does not appeal to me. I would just complain until my mom bought me a thing. And therefore, I had Huffies like my entire life. I think I had a Murray at one point, but it was pretty much Huffies. And I felt like I kind of deserved it because I could never pop a wheelie or like even jump a curb or do that hop thing that kids do on bikes. I, I couldn't do any of that. And those of you who did not grow up as fat kids know this, that it's not just an image thing. It's not just like vanity. Like I'm fat and I don't want to take my shirt off at the pool. There were things you couldn't do. Like the skinny kids could jump their bikes. And as a, a fat kid, I fucking couldn't. So I told myself, I rationalized that I didn't deserve anything better because I was too wow. fat to, to do a wheelie. C- could you do a wheelie? No, not consistently. I could, I could get the front tire up, but then it's like that balance of too much, too little. And I found myself, I, I maybe I'm right. I couldn't keep it up because it was a lot of weight. I was front loaded at that point. So I couldn't do it. But you could ollie, right? You could like ollie over like a like a, a concrete parking strip. No. Nah. No tail nah. whip or anything. Maybe. But I bet you could do like the, the burnout slides or whatever. I, yeah, I could where do you burnout come in slides. hot and you drop like the, the back yeah. tire. Yeah, I mean, th- the thing is, is I didn't have a chrome thruster <laughs> with the GT head and bear trap pedals. That's why I couldn't do it. <laughs> if you had a red line crank, you would have. Right. You definitely exactly. would have improved your, your torque ratio by about 20%. By the way, this carried over into like adult life too, because my friends and I rented scooters in Costa Rica this last week and they're all just zipping through the mountains and everyone's just waiting on me. Like at every cafe, they would stop and be like, all right, he's, he's coming along eventually with multiple questions of, is your bike okay? Yeah, it's okay. It's me. It's me. Well, the Hell Track race is endorsed by the city and by Duke Best, the president of the Federation of American Bicyclists, who's also the owner of Mongoose Racing. Duke keeps adjusting the race qualification rules in order to keep crew out of the race and ensure BMX star Bart Taylor has an easy road to victory. A win for Bart on national TV would provide a financial windfall for Duke Best's Mongoose Racing, which sponsors Bart. So I found myself watching this film and reminiscing not only about my experience with the bike, but also how bikes are key in a lot of the movies we do. If you think about the Goonies, if you think about even today when they they you know reminisce about the 80s and we see like needful things. The bikes, they're a character. They're part of the adventure that kids go on. E.T., you can't make those movies or the the pinnacle, the escape at the end there without it being a BMX bike. You know, that these kids would be out there. It was their mode of transportation. I found myself thinking, I don't see kids out anymore using the bikes. So I did some research here, and I'm so happy, Gene, because we are old men on the, the port screaming at clouds that BMX is actually cool again. It is coming back that the value they think in 2020 was like $230 million, that it's cool again to do this. It's probably because of the X game stuff and the stunts, but Mongoose actually sponsored a three-day celebration of Rad and the Hell Track race in Texas. All the cast showed up who was still alive except for Laughlin. She is, I guess she's too big for this film now. Maybe she was just mad that the ass on the dude that was her stunt biker made her look like she had no ass and huge shoulders. My friend uh, Jenny, she got her daughter Valley into BMX recently. And I thought that was so fucking cool. Like, I think it's rad that kids are doing no pun intended. The kids are doing this again. And I got to say that I hope if I have a kid, like she'll be into cool shit like Muay Thai and BMX. That's fun as a parent, even as a non-parent, as a friend of the parent. And somebody's like, Hey, you want to come watch my kid BMX race? (laughs) Fuck. Yeah. It's way better than like going to a dance recital or flag football or something. Oh, it's so much better. It's so, and I'm glad that kids are out there being active. But the, the main plot, if we're going to get back to the movie here. So there is the small town that seems to be down on its luck. We don't know if it, like some kind of industry has moved out, but we get to meet Timmer, who is a local dude who seems to is it a bike shop or some business he owns. And he's now in cahoots with, with Duke and they're 50-50 partners in some deal. The best I can tell is that Bart Taylor, they have some licensing deal that if Hell Track comes into this podunk town and he wins, they're going to somehow monetize it with like Bart Taylor gear. 
but he's already the best BMX guy. He's on the cover of the magazines. The girls are like, Bart, kiss me, kiss me next. What more do they need? It, was there some part of this deal I didn't get? No, they keep saying like profit, money, like it's some nefarious Margin. thing. There's nothing nefarious going on here. You want to make <laughs> no. the town famous for the race. You want to make Mongoose Racing famous for having good bikes. And here's the thing. Fucking crew is riding a Mongoose bike. So even if he wins, you're like, yeah, Mongoose. That's what. Fuck that's yeah. the part I didn't get. Why does Best have such a hard on for paying off crew to lose and Bart to win? He could get crew on his crew as well. And now you've got you've got the cards stacked in your favor either way. Dude, he, he bribes him. Spoiler alert here at the end. He says, 10 grand, you come in, you're part of the team, and you just got to lose. If he had just said, hey, 10 grand, join the team, you race. It is a win for everybody. And this is like in, in I think like in uh, Austin Powers where where Dr. Evil is unaware of the value of money and keeps like somehow lowering the amount like one million. Everybody should look at him and be like, dude, why are you making this so hard? The community's happy. The community's winning. The sponsors are happy. Well, why not just go with the flow? Check this out. Hypothetically, he hires crew on to the team, right? Mm -hmm. Now- in this race, his bikes would be numbers one, two, three, and four. Here are the top four finishers in the fucking race on Mongoose bikes for Team Mongoose. But Mongoose is now dominating. But Gene, we talked about this before we recorded. How was Mongoose as a company, right? You have to get licensing. So the, the writers of Rad went to them and said, hey, we want Mongoose to be the main product. They're going to be the hero bike in this film. We're going to have a character who's going to be the CEO of Mongoose. He's going to be corrupt. He's going to be manipulative. He's going to abuse the kid's trust. He's going to lie. How is Mongoose cool with this? Because this is the most realistic portrayal of how businesses actually are. Like the CEO, the top guy is always a dickhead, even if the product's really awesome. I don't think I've ever met the top of any company that's been like rad, even if the company itself is cool. And Mongoose was so cool about being the bad guys. And that has to do with Skip Hess. So Skip Hess was the founder of Mongoose Bicycles. And when they're making this movie, he's like, yeah, all right. Like, that sounds fun. Like, he didn't give a shit. He was fine with it. Yeah, it's that outlaw. Yeah, it probably made Mongoose the cool bike for the outlaw kids who just didn't care. It's all about winning. Well, as BMX racers show up from around the world, Crew meets Christian Hollings, who becomes his romantic interest. At Crew's senior prom, he and Christian perform freestyle bike stunts on the dance floor to the awe of his classmates. Mm. After oh, being yeah. blocked from the race due to a last-minute rule change on participant sponsorship, Crew is ready to give up on Helltrack until Wesley customizes a shirt for him to wear at the event. Crew and his friends use the money he won from qualifying, $10,000, to found a small t-shirt business called Rad Racing. So this movie, surprisingly, I'm going to say it, it, it subverts my expectation in a lot of ways. I'm thinking, you know, you got this professional biker she's coming in. Crew's going to be just in awe and he's going to fall deeply in love. No, he's playing a bit hard to get. And then also the town, normally in any of our extreme movies, whether it's surfing movies, skydiving, any extreme movies, normally the athletes or the kids are misunderstood and the town just doesn't get skateboarding and gleaming the cube and the parents are against them the town the teacher everybody wants them to change and conform not this town this town actually supports their kids they're promoting the kids they have town meetings where they actually come together and think about their children's dreams and about the advantages of biking and staying healthy. I was totally expecting the police to be the bad guy, but no, they're actually one of the biggest advocates for their kids, and it was a nice change. And it's crazy because they are kind of a menace. Like, you've got kids literally riding on cars. I mean, Cruz slams into a car at one point. He also True. rides over that blue car, like over the hood, the windshield, the top of the car, and then back over the trunk. I mean, they are kind of a menace. They're riding on logs in the lumber yard. That's dangerous. That's true, but he, he also helps people. If you're baking a cake, he'll help you open the barricade to get there. The one where he gets on top of the roof and the mother doesn't even notice it, that's scarier, the fact that she's driving her kids around. But it seems like they want him, they want crew to hit the record, to deliver by 710. And they're rooting him on. He's like, yeah, come on, yeah, crew. As he's throwing the papers, he's improving his aim, throwing them to the dudes, like fishing in the lake. It's a, it's a town. They're, they're there for each other. They don't even care if you ride your bicycle into the, into the prom. 
That's that's totally no, fine. It's not ruining fine. a time for anybody. Not those kids who paid to go to prom and actually wanted to dance. Fuck it. Everybody move out. We got these <laughs> got these fucking professional riders from Mongoose who come out to do a little bicycle boogie, which is incredibly erotic, uh, by the way. Oh, but I was God. mad at myself for liking the bicycle boogie. And again, if you haven't seen the movie, so first you get Bart and his crew and they go out and they're doing their little sexy dances, which, by the way, if you ever wondered what dancing would look like if it was choreographed by a person who was both straight and white. This is it. This is what you get. They're they're trying to be sexy in the way that Chardonnay is trying to be a wine. But then we get Lori Laughlin. She comes out. They're all encouraging her to come out dancing. Does she dance with Bart? Oh, no. No, she no. wants to dance with crew. She wants to dance with the new guy. And yes, it's corny as fuck. And yes, the stunts were clearly faked. These, this is bicycle dancing, by the way. I should have clarified but it's set to send me an angel, which I will never be able to unsee again. Anytime I'm on the dance floor in the club, all I'm going to be able to think about is Bicycle Boogie. But the whole setup, it's so genuine and it's so ridiculous. And if you think this movie could make, be made in 2023, <laughs> you're crazy. This is so perfectly 1986. There is zero cynicism. They think this is cool. Doing bicycle stunts to send me an angel in the middle of the senior prom and everyone would just step back and go, wow. They think it's cool because it was cool. This was amazing. The best part, people out there, we know. You know that Lori Laughlin, you know she's not doing the stunts. So I keep trying to find the seams. Like, obviously, the shots are from a distance. So you can't see the stunt double's face. But they have to mix in these shots of, like, the actors, like, whoa, yeah, making these facial reactions where you can tell the bike isn't moving, that it's mounted on a platform. And yes, I'll let that go because you have to see the actors, you know, trying to <laughs> mimic like Star Trek. Shake right, shake left, you're popping a wheelie. But for the dancing scene, they had to build like a round carousel and they mounted the bikes with opposing wheelies. So they're facing each other like swans. <laughs> they then start spinning it on the dance floor as the music is up to a crescendo. And they're looking at each other and Lori Laughlin's like, <sighs> like making these <laughs> facial That's her movement. thing. I've discovered That's that is her thing. thing. And they're spinning on the dance floor. And it it is it is so wonderful, Gene. It is so wonderful. This movie is just full of those unexpected moments. And I think that's what makes it a bit of a treasure in that you don't know what they're going to do next. And every time you think it can't get more ridiculous, it does. There's a scene where crew tells Christian, like, I want to show you my hometown. Like, let's go on an adventure so I could show you everything. And you know you're going to get a music montage. You know you're going to see all the places in town that are kind of romantic. And maybe it'll end in some big crescendo. No, they go full bore right out the gate. <laughs> Instead of like sexy synthesizers while riding through a field, their first adventure is sliding down a water slide directly into a lake. And unlike Bloodsport, which gave us an eight minute flashback of Frank's childhood, Rad gives us a flashback to the water slide scene immediately after the water slide scene. It's like you saw it and then you just see it again from a different angle. This might be the only instant flashback in 80s film history. Yeah, but he, he, Gene, you're also he. So Lori Laughlin, she's this this big time professional sponsored rider. She comes into town. He says, would you like to go ass sliding with me right now? That, that's not <laughs> our description. The town calls it ass sliding. Ass -sliding. She would have slapped him. Hey, you want to go ass sliding with me down by the river? Nobody can see us down there. And they're frolicking. They're in the water. They're splashing. They're throwing rocks. But there's something so innocent and just cute about it. And it's even later on, he says, God, as he's winning the race, what I wouldn't give to be ass sliding right now with you. Did you get a Friday the 13th vibe when they were down by the water and she picked up that big rock? I thought she was going to crush his fucking skull with it. She's like, eh. Just throws it at his feet. I thought we were going to get the camera pan to the woods and you were going to just see like that, oh, that homeless guy, like just staring at them like, you kids. <laughs> or just somebody just standing there watching. Fucking ass sliders. <laughs> ass sliders. <laughs> a few days before the race, Duke changes the rules yet again, claiming any company sponsoring a racer must be worth at least $50,000. Just arbitrary, arbitrary dollar amounts. When the townspeople hear about this, they rally around crew and their contributions, particularly a generous donation from the wealthy Mr. Timmer, provide rad racing with enough money for crew to enter hell track. So... The whole time Duke Best is trying to eliminate crew from competition, 
he's changing the rules by saying you need a sponsor and then saying you need a major sponsor, $50,000. He misses the real nail in the coffin that drives so many 80s movies. When you're going after Arnold or you're going after Jean-Claude Van Damme, you don't go after the man himself. The hero's too tough to beat. You go after his woman. You go after the hero's girl. Christian, she works for Mongoose Racing. Duke could just say, hey, crew, you play ball, you throw the race, or your girlfriend, she loses her job. Yeah, I think that's a great one. No, I mean, you you danger like the whole Arnold thing. You create the ultimate weapon by doing that. You create a killer biking machine that might just go out and just destroy all the entire field. But I thought also I was waiting for the sabotage montage or the sabotage moment where Duke would either go to a member of the town and come in and like loosen his bolts. Yeah, he did it to himself. He rode his fucking competition bike into the lake. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a real bad idea. Dude, also, how about you take off your jeans? Okay, 80s jeans are not flexible. You have to be hurting yourself. He's wearing a hockey helmet. Get some decent equipment. Take care of your bike. Lube it up. Clean it up. Try to remove as many like the off-the-shelf parts and make it more aerodynamic. But you're right, Gene. Go after her. Have her turn on him. Have her have a moment of the whole time it said she's supportive. She's helping him. Inflict some pain on her and see if crew crumbles. Also, if you want to eliminate one of his friends and make a sympathetic, uh, like Luke, his friend who bends his front wheel, maybe have him like actually get injured because I'm sitting there thinking, okay, they've got different heats in this race. Can he not go get another wheel and put it on his bicycle? He just holds it up like like his leg is broken. Oh, crew, you got to do this for me, man. My wheel's bent. Yeah, why not the twins? They go out with a wrench. They go into Rad Racing's pits. They loosen the bolts. So now we're watching like, whoa, when's this going to happen? And all we see is the close up on the front wheel as the bolt is slowly loosening up. And we're waiting. Oh, no, what's going to happen to crew? And he comes down the hill. It's Luke. Wheel falls off. Luke flips. Boom, he's in the hospital, just like Jackson and Bloodsport. Speaking <laughs> And speaking of wrecks, did you see that kid who wrecked coming off the bowl and spoon obstacle? There is this incredibly dangerous obstacle in the middle of this final race. It's a, it's like a cereal bowl or an ice cream bowl with uh, a spoon kicks. sticking out of it. And they mm -hmm. got to ride into the bowl and then off of this giant spoon. This one kid comes off of that spoon. He flips and hits like face first into the ground. I watched it three times. That could not have been scripted. I think this guy died. He flips hard. He flips fast. And it made me wish that the movie focused more on the danger and the speed and the technicality of BMX racing rather than just flashy stunts. This is really exciting stuff. When they're racing, I have zero complaints. No, none. But the most dangerous obstacle takes most people out is the pond. The pond <laughs> in the park. There's at least three or four racers who lose control around that turn and just go straight into the lake. And of course, the, the townsfolk just happened to be canoeing by at the time just to get that mix of exciting hell track and pastoral bliss. During the race, Duke orders the Reynolds twins to take out crew, but they fail, partly because Bart wants to race crew one on one. In the final stretch of the race, Bart and crew face each other. Crew ultimately wins hell track while Bart is dropped from Mongoose Racing. Crew offers Bart a spot on Rad Racing while Duke is asked to resign from the FAB. So, Big D, I know you're a stickler for the rules. We don't get a ton of them here. When they actually explain the rules of Hell Track and Duke is telling us, you know, how the, the heats will work and how elimination works, they never really get into like the specifics of, you know, do you have to stay on the track? What happens if two bikes collide or anything like that? And I've got to ask, what is the point? of laying out this giant track across town with flags and cordons if racers can just ride wherever they want. Because other racers are forced to navigate through the pack. They're dealing with bumping into each other. They're dealing with these obstacles that are specifically set up on the track. Cruz says, fuck all that. He fucking rides around the traffic. He takes shortcuts through town. He's clearly cheating, right? Oh, it, he's definitely cheating, but he has to, Gene. He's fighting fire with fire. Duke is corrupt. Duke is changing the rules. Duke, he knows he's throwing people at him. Yeah, it's televised, and I would hope that some people would see it. And there's no effect. I mean, it's not like he's hiding it. He does a backflip and totally skips the cereal bowl. How every other rider didn't just take that route the next time around. But he's he's got to do it. That's what he's got to do to win, Gene. I think he was jumping the track, though, before the qualifiers were even over. You think so? I know so. 
He jumped between those two trees. He goes during the qualifying heats. He goes outside of the pink cordons, comes back onto the track. M- maybe he's just smarter than everybody else. Maybe he's writing the rules. But Gene, overall, you have to say that you mentioned how it's exciting. BMX racing is exciting. I'm waiting for this this hell track, which is it's it's going to be the most challenging track on the entire planet. It is going to push people to the extreme. They have to have multiple disciplines. It's going to combine freestyle and BMX, like cross, you know, the racing. I was disappointed. Yeah. The, 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 all the qualifiers are the equivalent of cross-country racing. It's like a, a run through the park. It is on grass. It is on paths. It is not extreme at all. It is just laid out. And then we get to Hell Track Gene. And I'm expecting like, like something of, from like an apocalyptic film obstacles, things swinging, things that you would need to do freestyle slides and moves to get around. But it was this tiny, compact, like little course that people couldn't get up any speed. It looked tiny. It made the BMX look small. The guys never got up to high speeds. It's like out in LA when NASCAR comes and they do this race in the Coliseum where it is so small that cars never get up to speed. This final track, you can't think this is an epic climax. Now, as far as the qualifiers go, I think that was an add-on, right? Once they were asked, how, what are they going to do for the local kids? I think they just kind of threw them a bone and they just, you could tell it looked pretty ramshackle. Like they just put it together. So that part I, I understand, but you're absolutely right. As far as the hell track itself, it needed to be a little more extreme, exciting, I guess, or a little more extreme. Yeah. You should see, I don't know, in, in my opinion, half the pack should be eliminated just from wrecking. That's what I want to see. This is BMX biking. This isn't you know, just road racing. This this should be something different. Yeah. The only thing they had was what they call it, the baseball, like where you, if you didn't make it up on the platform, you're out, you know, oh, he made it. He's safe. That platform, there should have been maybe the bowl of cereal. It could have been raised over like a pool of water, swinging objects that I wanted like American gladiators mixed with an extreme form of BMX that you can't call it hell track. And it's this bullshit. I think they specifically built the track just to fuck with Hollywood Mike Miranda because that poor guy had a bad day. Like he had like two wrecks in one lap. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But when it does come down to crew and Bart, I got to admit, I was excited. They gave us a full lap watching these two guys go head to head. And it's a tight race. And I'm invested in all of this. And as they cross the finish line, crew does this trick where he spins his BMX backward to cross the finish line tail first. And initially I scoffed. I thought this was complete bullshit. And over the next 12 hours, as I was traveling back from Costa Rica to Arizona, this scene is haunting me. I go back and I replay it. I started making models with my Southwest snack mix while I was on the plane. I was asking other travelers as I went by. I spent like five minutes outside the Papa's Burger in Houston Hobby Airport, walking around in circles, trying to map out this scene. And after all that, I've concluded that this would actually work. I think this would actually work because if if you're airborne... Your ass end is longer than your front end. So if you spin it around while you're still in the air, you'd cross faster. You're crazy. Did you not? Wa- if you watch it closely, when he does that hot dog move, Bart Taylor, because when he starts to spin at that point, Bart's front wheel is in front of him because he's yeah. now perpendicular. The bike, right. <laughs> Cruz bike is perpendicular. There's not some magical force that kicks the rear end around. If you watch it, he loses the race because he's hot dogging. No, no, no. Imagine this. Imagine you've got a baseball bat and you're holding it over your head, right? Pointing backward. So so the end of the bat's in your hands. The the barrel of the bat is all the way behind you, right? And you're running a race. Yep. And then at the last second, you swing the bat around till it's pointing out forward from your head. You would win the race the, faster because you're longer the to the front. Here's the difference. You're, in that argument, the bat would be facing forward to begin with. You then rotate it towards the back and bring it full circle. For that half rotation you have shortened your bike from your seat to the handlebars. No, disagree. You misunderstand. Allow me to demonstrate. Uh, see me? Yep, I see This you. is the bat. It's pointing back already. That's the tail end of the bike. As I come to the end, I swing it forward. R- right, but you're missing the front tire now. That's in front of you, Gene. You <laughs> have to turn that and then you know move your hips to spin the back end around. But you're already airborne. Uh, Gene, go back and watch. The tape doesn't lie. The ta- this was televised. Okay, he listen, lost it. He lost. To it. those of you f- physics uh, experts out there, I almost said physicians. That's not true. <laughs> physics ge- geometrists. If that's 
if that's a thing. Bikers, anybody out there, please write in and let us know who's right on this. I think the spin trick would work. Okay, let's just talk about we're in a race, right? Usain Bolt, he's getting towards the finish line. Instead of just running through the line and having his hands out, he brings his hands back and tries to swing his legs to lead him across the finish line. the same thing. That's exactly the same thing. Think about a baseball slide. But that's, that. no. Now, people, go back and watch. Tell us what you think. I personally think that crew, he was hot dogging. He lost it. And but But here's also a question, Gene. The race now comes, right? Duke's own just incompetence as a businessman, a cheater. Now he not only lost Bart off his team, now all that Bart merchandise for Mongoose is completely worthless. It is worth nothing. You kicked him off the team. He didn't win. He's now part of rad racing. It's a lose-lose for Mongoose across the board. It's incredibly short-sighted. Who's to say that Bart's not going to win the next race, which he possibly will, right? It's not like Crew automatically qualifies for every race after that. It's not like Crew's going to beat him every time. That was a very close race, and chances are Bart's going to beat him two out of three. Right, but it's about the team. Do you think they pick up the twins, or are the twins done with Bart after his uh, his shenanigans under the uh, the bridge? Oh, I think that the twins are middle management kind of guys. They they just stick around for whatever company will take them. I think they just they're just there. Uh, but the coolest characters in the movie by far. Oh, their outfits, that like V, like suit they mm. wore to the dance, which looks like V, the alien's uniform. Or they look like the twins in G.I. Joe. I sent you a picture of that. I think it's like Tomax Zardan and Zaymox. and Zaymox. Yeah, they look like those two dudes. Zartan and Zaymax? No, Zymox and... <laughs> God, what is it now? Now you got me. It's Zay- Tomax and oh, Zaymox. To- yes, that's it. Tomax is backward. <laughs> I was thinking about Zartan. That's a, the one who could change colors in the light, but... <laughs> yeah, I'd be curious to see what happens to rad racing. I really don't think you're going to go mass market. You can't up, you can't scale your business when you got kids drawing your logo with magic markers. I don't think that's a sustainable business model. By the way, if you're looking for those t-shirts, uh, they have them at, at the Walmart in the hoodie form. Regular t-shirts on eBay for, I think, about $17. And the crew neck, which is really the way to go, the red crew neck, is about 30 bucks on Etsy. So get out there and get your rad racing gear. Now's the time in the podcast where we give our chat score. Our chat score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie takes to get our perspective. But Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is wearing the perfect casual outfit to prom that magically comes alive when the spotlights hit your hidden sequins accents during the bicycle boogie. And Five Wipes is a disaster of a movie. It is being as cool as Hollywood Mike Miranda and being denied the win you so richly deserve. Big deal. We'll start with you. What is your wipe score for? Rad. This was one, Gene, where I... I- I had to think. I said, I'm going to go into it with an open mind. I want to be balanced. I want to be fair and balanced. I want to respect the film, also respect Frank, respect my memories. I, I mean, I, I think I think it's an average film. I think they were trying to do a lot of good things. I think it was exciting for kids to to go out on their bikes. But to me, the one weakness it has is it didn't inspire the general kid to go out and have an adventure. The Goonies made me want to go out and look for treasure. You know, BMX bandits wanted me to go out there and, and fight crime, even gleaming the cube. But I thought it was entertaining. It was uh, it was so fun. And, and I kept hearing Frank's voice throughout. So for that, I think two and a half is fair. It's an average film. It is not four wipes. This is not Mac and me. Two and a half. Frank, it's for you. It's for all those kids out there in middle America going out in their backs and having a good time. So I hope you enjoyed it. And people go out there and watch it and tell me who wins, because I think Cruz lost that race. Frank, I hope that you understand the score I'm about to give comes with a healthy side of love because I really enjoyed watching this movie, but I can't, in all honesty, recommend it to others. I have to be objective on this. If you stripped out all the dumb stunts that drag this movie down, it's pretty entertaining. I really enjoyed it. The characters, they're quirky. The scenarios are charmingly forced. Like None of this needed to happen, but it's so fun to watch. And I spent a lot of time screaming, what?! And then nodding, okay. But when a movie is 90 minutes long, there can't be any fat left on it. I would have really enjoyed learning more about racing and less about crew trying to master a flip that he never needs to use. But this guy's training for the race of his life. And instead, he's out there trying to do flips on a mattresses. It, it absolutely makes no sense. It's a, There's some waste of time in there. So I'm going to come just below Big D with a healthy three wipes for Rad. And with three wipes for me and two and a half wipes from Big D, that gives us an average wipe score of 2.75 wipes for Rad. 
Gene, with a respectable 2.75 wipes, that now ties this in the 204 spot with Kingpin, Robot Jocks, and Notting Hill. Slightly better than Big, Licensed to Kill, Star Trek Two, and slightly worse than 12 Monkeys, Crocodile Dundee, and L.A. Story. I really did not like L.A. Story. No, no, but Sandy was a good, it was something to live by. It was a good mantra. I absorbed that from that film. True. All right, Frank, again, I hope that you know I feel very guilty with that wipe score because it is a subjectively, as far as enjoyment goes, I, I got a lot of love for this movie. I would watch it again. Objectively, I can't really recommend it to other people. And what we try to do here on Shout the Movies is note if a movie holds up. And I don't know that this one does. Anyway, I think I think Frank should be happy. His, his expectations were set so low. I think he's honestly going to be shocked and surprised with 2.75. Well, let's continue these good vibes into our mailbag. This week, we have a few emails. The first one comes from Matt, who's writing in about Runaway. He says, I just listened to the podcast. It was great. I love the side discussions about New Coke, the actor who plays Vigo, and Eric Clapton. So this one's about Ghostbusters too. I love all the weird shit Gene digs up about the movies. I wanted to check and see if this movie had been reserved. And it's 1984's Runaway. I remember watching it when I was a kid, and it has Tom Selleck, Kirstie Alley, and Gene Simmons. Got to be some good fodder for the show. I never see or hear anything about it, so I think it's kind of a forgotten movie from the 80s, and that comes from Matt. Ooh, this is not a forgotten movie, Matt. I love this film. Love it, love it. It opens up where Tom Selleck is this rugged, handsome cop, great mustache. They're in a helicopter, and they're flying over some fields, and all you see is like a zigzag pattern. And it is some kind of harvesting robot that is actually, I think it was supposed to pick off bugs. It has gone wild and rogue. So he's part of this team that goes after robots that are out of control. So we start seeing robots across LA start to become corrupted, where it's a house robot, like gets a gun and murders like the family. And Tom Selleck's got to get in there. Spoiler alert, Gene Simmons might have something to do with it. It is so campy, and I think with technology, the way it is today and the way actually it, it went against what we expected in the, I think it was late 80s or 90. I don't remember what the year was. I would love, love, love to do this film. I just want the opportunity to objectify 1984 Kirstie Alley, so I'm all in for this one. Oh, so good. All right, next up we have one from Shannon uh, writing in about Ordinary People. Shannon says, hey, guys, reaching out to see if be open to a commission for the movie Ordinary People. My husband's birthday is coming up next week, and I know he'd love to hear you guys cover this one. Let me know. And Big D, I think you've been in touch with Shannon, if that's correct. I have. And this is <laughs> kind of an odd film to be a birthday gift, but uh, we'll, we'll go with it. It's an Academy Award winning film. But here's the description. And if, tell me if this doesn't scream happy birthday to you. Tormented by guilt following the death of his older brother, Buck, in a sailing accident, alienated teenager Conrad attempts suicide. Returning home to follow an extended stay in a psychiatric hospital, Conrad tries to deal with his mental anguish and also reconnect with his mother, Beth, who has grown cold and angry and emotionally wandering father, Calvin. With the help of a psychiatrist, Dr. Bergman, the family struggles to stay together. It came out in 1980. That screams happy birthday to me. I feel like this is just an end around to try to get us to do something like Prince of Tides without actually asking for Prince of Tides. Like, hey, what does Prince of Tides cost? A thousand dollars. Will you do ordinary people? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. So it's on the schedule. Thank you very much. This will be a, a, a birthday spectacular. This might be one of those rare soul bearing episodes for Shat. There's been a couple of them. Harry Met Sally. That was a. Yeah. Oof, makes me was... think of it all the time. There's some of these movies that, that just trigger something that actually does lead to it. So maybe it'll be one of those special moments. Well, thanks, Shannon, for your commission. I can't wait to get to Ordinary People. Big D, what do we have coming up next week? Gene, next week in a coming-of-age comedy, Tim Dumphy is leading a go-nowhere existence, spending his days smoking pot and hanging out with his best friend, Drugs Delaney. But Tim's lazy days of getting high or jettisoned after a brush with the law convinces his blue-collar dad to send him to a Connecticut prep school. The one saving grace is the new school is the wonderful Jane, a fellow student who Tim falls immediately for. This is Mark S.'s commission. Came out in 99 and... This, this will be an interesting film. And we had to flip up the schedule a bit. But uh, this one, Mark, I see what you did. I see what you did. 
All right. It's going to be tough to follow up on Frank's Commission of Rad, but we'll see what you can do, Mark. Thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. Email us, host at ShatTheMovies.com. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or by commissioning your own movie. Find all the information by visiting our website, ShatPod.com. Also, check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV. We review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all the information on our website, shatpod.com slash TV, where everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-host, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Join us next week for the following movie. Hello, Bob. What the hell are you doing out there? He's getting my jacket. Greg, you pimply butt in here and say hi to the guys. Show some class, for God's sake. Timothy Dunphy has a broken home. What are you up to? No. A three-legged dog. Get that mangy flea bag out of this house! And two strikes against him. <laughs> you hit a parked cop car. Oh. His friends may have no future. Cut it out, huh? But he's about to get one, whether he likes it or not. What's a prep school? It's to prepare you for not getting your neck broke by me. You can't send me away my senior year. And the only way he'll stay out of jail is if he can survive this year. Hey, Fonzie. Now he's out of place. No smoking, no drinking, no drugs. No swearing, no sex. Outclassed. Mr. Dunphy, who launched the New Deal? NASA? And seriously outnumbered. Forget about it. You got a better chance of being struck by lightning. It's beautiful. Just what I always wanted. Yeah, I got it at the dentist. From the Farrelly brothers, the guys who made There's Something About Mary, comes something that will really make your hair Making sex is like Chinese dinner. It ain't over until you both get your cookies. Remember I said that. Outside Providence. Look out, want you.